Hello, everybody. Journalism is alive and kicking here at the Jerusalem Press Club. And with us this time is Annika uh, Rothstein, a Swedish author, journalist, pundit. Glad to have you here, Annika. Hi. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Let me start by quoting your Twitter. <laughs> I'm the Jew Mel Gibson warned you about. Journalist, yeah. author, lover of meat, freedom, and smooth cigars. Nice yes. to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Uh, what kind of cigars? Well, any cigars at this point. I've been stuck in Africa for six months and, and they've been very sparse. So, uh, but I like my Cuban and Dominican. So, you know, okay. yeah. And you also uh, describe yourself as a staunch conservative. What does it mean to you? Well, I call myself a Reagan conservative. I have friends who call themselves Reagan Democrats, which, uh, well, I'm Swedish, so it might be a weird way of describing myself, but given that we don't really have a strong conservative movement in my country of birth, I identify more strongly with, I'm a fiscal conservative, I'm a social conservative, uh, which means um, I'm old school, you might say. I believe in personal choice uh, and freedom and responsibility in a framework of um, conservative thought. Now, how does that combine with your journalism? I mean, it does in the sense that I've written mainly for what would be described at, as conservative outlets. I've written for Commentary, Wall Street Journal, uh, National Review, uh, Fox News, places like that. Because of course, as we all know, any of us who, who dabble in journalism, that it's a very black and white world out there right now, that you get pigeonholed pretty quickly. But I would say in, in this day and age, it's mostly the, the topics that I've written about. You know, a couple of years ago, I started writing a lot about immigration and immigration in Sweden and Europe and, and the things that concerned me at the time. And at that point, I realized that the more liberal outlets were less interested hmm. in, in having that point of view. So it's not so much that I chose the conservative outlets, but rather that they chose me based on what I wanted to write about. And of course, I've also written extensively about anti-Semitism in Europe and in Sweden specifically. And that's something that is a very touchy subject um, that we've learned on the liberal and, and left-wing side. Right. And we'll, a lot of people we'll get, don't want to touch that. Yeah. We'll get to that. But I want to ask you, uh, is um, non-political journalism dead? There's no way to have a, an independent point of view anywhere anymore. I think because we're so focused on the person. Uh, it's, it's a cult of personality also in journalism. We're not supposed to be stars by any means. Like it's not anyone who's a journalist knows the reality of journalism is not glamorous uh, by any measure, but because they look at you, they look at the person behind the text. So even when I write something that I don't think should be uh, politically swayed or politically interpreted. Uh, when I worked in, in Venezuela, for example, and I wrote a lot about the poverty I saw and the suffering I saw, uh, people would rather, because it's sort of an untouchable subject, but they would attack me, the person behind the text, rather than the text itself. And then it becomes, you know, a bat to swing in a political fight. So I think because we're so focused on, on the person, and it's become, you know, maybe it was all, always sort of a rock star career, but now you're so focused on the person because, also because there's no real money in journalism anymore. So you have to be out there and you have to market yourself and you have to push the envelope. So because of that, it becomes a really binary situation. Right, it's all personal these days. It is. Um, yeah, about anti-Semitism, I, I dare to say that you, you almost enjoy teasing the anti-Semites. Am I correct? <laughs> well, I found, found out a long time ago, for better or worse, that they won't hate you any less if you diminish yourself or you become less of what you are. Um, it, it seems to enrage them even more. I learned that at a very early age. And be, so I might as well be out there. You know, I might, might as well be the Jewiest Jew as I say, but also because of some of it is pretty dark. I mean, some of the stuff that I, that I receive in my direct messages in my daily life, it's pretty dark stuff. So if you don't sort of make fun of it a little bit, it will 
get you down. Like you'll be pulled into the black hole in which these people live. So it's, it's, it's a coping me mechanism as much as it is anything else, because you also have to pull them out. A lot of people and a lot of non-Jews get really shocked when they see the things that Jewish journalists put up with on, on a daily basis. And I think it is quite important to not give up on our relationship with non-Jews and, and show this to the world and say, well, you know, they, I have people superimposing my, my image on Holocaust imagery on a weekly basis. This is what I get in my direct messages. This is what I wake up to in the morning. And for most non-Jewish journalists, that's, that's a wake up call. And I think, you know, that's important work that we do as well so that people understand. And especially in a time when we talk a lot about privilege and where Jews are exempt from, you know, the, uh, that conversation or that we're seen as very privileged people. I think it's important to point out that this is not a new thing for us. This is something that we have, have lived with since the beginning of time. And, and that we perhaps, we take it on the, on the chin a lot more because suffering is so ingrained in, in our identity as Jews. So we accept it. And I don't necessarily think we should. I think that we should be out there and push this all the time. And sometimes I make fun of them because you know what, they're, most of them are just so easy to make fun of. So, <laughs> so why wouldn't I? <laughs> that's another way to deal with it. Uh, right. tell, tell me about your uh, latest ordeal in Africa. Well, so I've been working on my latest project, my, my previous book, uh, or my first book, Exile Portraits of the Jewish Diaspora. I've been running around the world, uh, visiting Jewish communities all over the world, but I was unable at the time to go to Africa. And so I went to Africa for what I thought was a three week stint. Uh, and then, of course, Corona, <laughs> and we went into a full full lockdown in Ghana uh, very early on. They closed the country after only two cases. So because they have experience, first of all, they don't really have the infrastructure to, you know, to experiment the way, certainly not the way that Sweden has. Um, and they have experience from previous pandemics. So they closed down pretty quickly. And I found myself living in West Africa for six months of my life. And I wouldn't, you know, by any means, of course it's difficult to be away from your family and from your normal circumstance, but it wasn't an ordeal in that way. It's been an extremely enlightening experience. Um, it's been interesting following this process and this crisis from an African perspective. It, it humbles you. And then I've been surprised by how well they've dealt with it. I must say, um, Ghana has dealt with this pandemic certainly better than Sweden has, and with a lot more grace than many countries. Uh, because I would say that, again, maybe that's a question of privilege, um, that they, they go through this, these extreme measures, you know, a full lockdown in a country where 80% um, live well beyond poverty means, and, and they sleep in shifts in their houses. So being locked down and locked in together means that people don't, you know, the 10 people that live in your one bedroom apartment don't have anywhere to sleep. And they do this with enormous grace um, and, and stick to -itiveness. And it's been, I think it's been a really good experience for me. I hope that I came out of it complaining less. Um, who knows? No promises, but, but I, I hope so. You've been to places like uh, Iran and, and Venezuela, we'll talk about that, as an independent uh, mm -hmm. journalist. Um, it's tough when you don't have a news organization behind you. How do you yeah. deal with that? Well, I mean, the biggest hit is always, and as most would tell you, financially. The risk is enormous, but also, as I found, especially in Venezuela, it's a physical, a direct physical risk because you have no backup. And what I found right at before I went to Iran, what I found very quickly is that you have to take the risk, you have to write on spec because people or organizations now, they don't have the funding. Um, some just don't have the inclination to send somebody into a dangerous situation to report things as they are. And I was becoming increasingly frustrated with a type of journalism where we basically just debate each other on Twitter. And we, discuss, we end up discussing rumors and somebody else's writing or somebody else's theory, and then it becomes a game of telephone. And that's not what journalism is. I, I really very, very strongly believe that journalism is showing up at a place and reporting what you see right in front of you. 
And that is what it should be. And, and that's what I want to do. That's the type of journalism that I want to do. And going to Iran, you know, that turned out well in the end. But of course, it's a risky situation. When I, as a private citizen, apply for a visa, I put my own money behind it. And I hope that everything will work out. You know, I'm a single Jewish woman walking in to the Islamic Republic, praying everything will work out because I really wanted to know what it was like. And in Venezuela, that risk was compounded by a lot of other factors, of course. And I found that when I was kidnapped the first time, for example, and you're put in a very violent situation in a very dangerous situation, it would have been a blessing to have the backing of an organization. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that I could be able to, would be able to do the things I, I do and go back so many times. You know, I went back six times, one after the other, continuing to report after being deported, after being kidnapped twice, you know, going through all of these things because I had a yearning to keep telling a story that was no longer really relevant in the news. People today don't care about Venezuela because it's a flash in the pan, like all these stories are. But if you want to have follow through and you want to continue to tell the longer story, I don't think that any organization is willing to put money, uh, you know, time and treasure behind that necessarily. But it, but it is a great loss because, you know, this type of storytelling, I don't see it a lot anymore. You see it in book form perhaps, but it means that there are already established journalists that have the financial, you know, possibility, the freedom, financial freedom to go somewhere and put that much money behind it. And, uh, or you have to, to risk it all, <laughs> which, which I chose to do. Right. So for a minute on the practical side, how, how do you mm -hmm. make a living out of this? What's the business model of this? Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of young journalists who are looking at this and saying, how are we going to survive in this profession? Well, the business model is to tell a story well and honestly. I mean, I, I know that sounds like advice your grandfather would give you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it does, it still holds up. And then in my case, you know, the blunt truth is I've made a living of going places where nobody else will want to go and telling stories that nobody else really wants to tell for a duration that nobody would put up with. And, and that was the business model because what you find very quickly, if you're not, you know, if you're not a columnist and by the way, those don't get paid very well either. I've been one for four years and that didn't pay very well. So you have to have side gigs and side hustles. That's just what the business is. And I think that unfortunately we don't demand getting paid. Like I did a seminar six years ago and, and a girl who was at this seminar called me the other day and said the one thing she remembered and was grateful about was, that I just kept saying, you know, demand getting paid because we have to show solidarity toward each other. That this journalism is viewed as a hobby today. And, and I, it's disgraceful. It's something that we're supposed to be so passionate about that we accept doing it for free. And that's unacceptable. This is a craft and everyone has to demand getting paid or no one will get paid. Because of course, if I say, you know, I'll write this article for $500 and somebody says, well, you know what? I have a 20 year old who's gonna do it for nothing for exposure. Then of course it devalues the entire industry and we have to show solidarity toward each other and demanding getting paid, even if it's not much, we have to demand getting paid something because otherwise it devalues our craft. And that's really important. And I've done that from the beginning, even from, I will admit a point where I didn't really deserve getting paid. <laughs> I've, demanded getting paid because it is a real job. And then the business model is you have to be out there and tell the real stories because sitting on Twitter and, you know, thinking that your feelings is an article that just doesn't hold up at the end of the day, you have to get out there and tell other people's stories and you have to be able to get really, really uncomfortable. It's, it's an incredibly uncomfortable and, the least glamorous job in the entire world. And if it, if it is glamorous, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> so, so that's the message to future journalists. Uh, don't look for glamour. Really don't look for glamour, but there will be endless joy. I will say that it's the most joyous because when you're so privileged that you get to tell other people's stories, your world expands tenfold. And it's the most amazing profession to be in but you have to find the thing that really makes you tick. And, and what I found was that I, I'm genuinely interested in other people, 
and you have to be really interested in other people because as most professions, journalism is about human connection and sitting down with somebody and, and listening to them. And then you find the story in that. Um, and I think that, you know, what's the business model? Well, it's, it, it's really, it's really tough. And you have to mostly write 20 articles on spec and then you get one and, and that's just what it is. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's worth it or I wouldn't be, you know, or I'd be a teacher now, like my mother wanted me to. So you, you, you just, the, the payoff is not necessarily um, financial. Um, so you'll be poor, but pleased <laughs> if you're like, well, me. maybe not, but, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely about passion as we can see. It is about passion. And I, I also think that it's about craft honing your craft. Oh, and, and get yourself a really good editor. Um, I would say that that's <laughs> because the, those are really the unsung heroes of our profession, that there are two or three people that spoke harsh truth to me at an early age. And I think that's the most important thing that if you find your humility early on, that's incredibly important that there were, I had a lot of editors who said, you know, you're far too emotional. You don't have to tell the, the reader how to feel or what to feel. And they gave me some incredibly important advice. And that hurts you because every, most journalists think they're a superstar and they think they're incredibly talented. But it's important to have those people in your life to tell you, you know what, you know, you need to do this better. You need to listen to this. And good editors are, are lifesavers in our business. So that's a very practical piece of advice. Listen to your editor. Right. Um... <laughs> Um, let me finish by asking about the uh, Swedish uh, contravirus model. How, what's happening? Well, right now, um, you know, our government is being very smug because after, after some real dark times, you know, we were nearing 6,000 dead in a country that is, you know, equal to size, and, not size, but equal to population to Israel. And, you know, they, they've gone the no mask no testing, no nothing route. Right now we have very, very few new cases, maybe one to a maximum five a day, I think. So we seem to be, have been hitting that plateau. So they're being really smug right now. However, I think there will be a great reckoning at the end of this, if there is an end to this, by the way. But at the end of this, there will be a great reckoning because what, what happened and what we've seen in these stories, especially on Twitter, you see children talking about how their parents are left to die basically because they have been given you know no oxygen no life support no nothing to people over the age of 70 and that's euthanasia you know and that's that has been the policy of the swedes and and you know th this is what sweden does and and anyone who knows anything about sweden swedish history knows that this is a very practical country that will do what is best for the bottom line and they did, they wanted to keep the country running. And so they made the decision that killing off some old people is worth the price of admission. And I think at the end of this, hopefully there will be a political price to pay for this government because it is, it has been a far from humane way of dealing with a very dire situation. But it, it you know, if you juxtapose Israel with Sweden, it's very interesting just because the population size is roughly the same because it speaks to the value of life and how a government views the value of one life. And that I think will be the interesting story to tell after this, because you see in Israel, yes, it has been extreme. And I have plenty of friends in Israel who complain about these measures, but at the end of the day, it speaks to how you value the lives of your citizens. And here, you know, you make sort of a mathematical judgment and say, oh, you passed your prime, the chips fall where they may. And, but at the end of the day, the, the country keeps right, running and the economy is sound. And that I hope is, is a story that I or other journalists will be able to tell at the end of this, if God willing, there is at some point an end to this. Let's hope. Let's Annika, hope. Annika, I thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.